In this video, we continue our journey towards the Northwest on our mission to visit all of the disused stations along the former Chicago Great Western Railroad route from Chicago to Oldwine, Iowa. We'll start from our most previous point of departure, German Valley, in the southeast corner of Stevenson County, Illinois, first traveling to South Freeport, then to Bolton, and finally to Pearl City in the southwest corner of Stevenson County. We will also visit railway artifacts of interest along the way. From German Valley, the South Freeport Depot is approximately five and a half miles to the northwest. To get there, we'll depart German Valley heading west along German Valley Road for four and three quarter miles. When we reach Hollywood Road, we'll turn right, heading north, traveling about one and a half miles. Reaching Borchers Road, we turn left, heading due west, driving for only a half mile. At Freeport Road, we turn right, again heading north. A third of a mile along this quiet road, we reach a dead end nearby where the South Freeport Station once stood. The former depot stood about 380 feet west of the Freeport Road and about 150 feet north of the end of the line of Freeport Road on the north side of the tracks in Silver Creek Township in Stevenson County, Illinois. We knocked on the door of the house at the end of the road in order to request permission to record video and photographs of the space behind their home. The homeowners knew all about the station that once stood directly behind their home, and they were kind enough to show us a painting that one of their parents had made of the original house that once stood on their property, which had been for decades the home of the Chicago Great Western South Freeport station agent. Just behind their house, the site of the depot lies in a cornfield, just south of the Albertus Airport, about 600 feet south of the runway. This Class E airport is owned by the city of Freeport and was contemporaneous for a few decades with the Chicago Great Western Line, having been originated in 1945. This was one of the original Chicago Great Western stations of 1887 and went through a few name changes early in its life. For a short period, it was referred to as Illinois Central Crossing, as it was a junction with the Illinois Central Railway heading north-south. It then became the Dunbar Station from 1888 until 1890. In 1891, the station name was formally changed to South Freeport no doubt to emphasize its relatively easy access to Freeport to the north. The residents of Freeport originally had high hopes that the railway would travel more directly through the fledgling city, but that plan never materialized. The South Freeport Depot was a wooden structure of Victorian stick-style design, slightly smaller than a typical CGW station, being about 40 feet by 20 feet in dimension, based upon aerial photographs. It was a full stop, being an interchange with the Illinois Central Railroad. It was also the regular stopping point for passenger traffic between Dubuque, Iowa and Chicago. The station rail yard included the depot, a few water towers, a few grain silos to the east and west, and a scattering of homes for railway workers, including the aforementioned station agent. There were also sidings heading to and from the Illinois Central Railroad. The station saw heavy use for shipping cattle and hogs from the region. Passenger service ended for this station, as it did for many of the stations along this route, in 1956, with the depot officially closed in 1958. The station and tracks were all removed sometime prior to 1971. The community of Dunbar and later South Freeport never saw more than a dozen homes in the area, 
even when the railroad station was at its zenith in the early part of the 20th century. The Chicago Great Western Railway Station and Illinois Central Interchange were the only reason for being in this small community, made up mostly of railway workers. The station agent lived in a house just to the southeast of the depot, residing in this house until the end of 1958. The depot and trackway were originally plotted in 1887 on property owned by Fred Amelsberg. The railway line heading north, representing the interchange with the Illinois Central to Freeport, was added sometime around 1900. This interchange gave the CGW a toehold into the larger Freeport market to the north, where goods and passengers, both coming and going, could be transferred to or from the Chicago Great Western Line. In its early days, horse-drawn carriages would taxi passengers to the station from Freeport to meet the CGW trains. By the 1920s, automobiles largely took over this role. A little more than a mile and a quarter to the west of the South Freeport Station lies the remnants of a major trust bridge that once passed over a creek gully. This was the Crane Creek Bridge. The remains of the bridge today sits on private property, but on a good day, you might be able to see it from a distance from the Oakdale Nature Preserve. To get there from the South Freeport Depot location, we head south along Freeport Road for about a half mile. We then turn right along the curve of the road, taking us west along Borchers Road. After a half mile, we arrive at Baileyville Road and turn right, heading northwest. Another half mile takes us to Cranes Grove Road, where we turn left, heading west. After a short distance winding along the Cranes Grove Road, we turn right into a Freeport Park District area, with a picnic shelter and hiking trails. If you walk along the hiking trails to their furthest point west, you'll be within about 500 feet of the Crane Creek Bridge, or what remains of the structure. The original bridge, constructed in 1888, spanned more than 300 feet across the Crane Creek Gully and stood 50 feet above the ground below. For most of its usable life, the bridge was of wood construction. However, it was replaced with the steel truss design in 1952. Railway service continued over this bridge until 1972, when it was finally decommissioned. The bridge was partially demolished in 1974, partially because some of the concrete piers and steel trusses were so costly to remove that they simply left the most obstinate pieces in place. Today, you might be able to get a glimpse of the bridge artifacts along a long driveway leading up to a home, or towards the end of the hiking trail along the Freeport Park District property. By a drone, we can see the remains of at least two piers jutting out from the foliage, modern standing stones aligned east to west. Perhaps future archaeologists will see these as ritual monuments marking the summer solstice. Before heading further west to the next station, this is a good place to talk about a rails-to-trails fail. In other video series, we've seen many highly successful rails-to-trails conversions, whether the Illinois Prairie Path with over 60 miles of publicly accessible trails in Cook, DuPage, and King counties, 
explore various pieces of the Chicago Great Western between Villa Park and West Chicago and St. Charles to Sycamore. These converted trails continue to fulfill, at least in some part, the original mission of the railways, of connecting communities and improving the overall quality of life of local residents. In the early 1970s, when the Chicago and Northwestern, the heir to the Chicago Great Western, was set to abandon more than 80 miles of right of way in Ogle, Stevenson, and Joe Davies counties, an attempt was made to create a rails to trails pathway from Byron, Illinois, extending to Dubuque, Iowa, traversing through some of the most scenic areas of Northern Illinois. The proposal had many organizations backing it, the Illinois State Department of Conservation, the Jane Addams Land Park Foundation of Stevenson County, the Winnebago County Forest Preserve District, the DeKalb County Bicycle Club, and even Commonwealth Edison, who wanted to use the right-of-way for electrical facilities, much like they have done with other rails-to-trails conversions. Many local citizens also supported the proposal, as it was seen as being a potential stimulant to local economies. However, local farmers along the right-of-way had a different point of view. They wanted to add the newly available property to their farming assets. And they also voiced concerns regarding the proposed pathway, as they felt they would need to put up fencing all along the former right-of-way to keep out intruders and vandals, and that EPA regulations would require them to move farm buildings and infrastructure away from the newly created public space. In the end, the local farmers held the day. The coalition of about 250 farmers leveraged the farm bureaus in their counties to establish land trusts in local banks for the railway to issue quick claim deeds to the adjacent property owners. It worked out to the benefit of these few hundred residents, but perhaps missed an opportunity for the communities touched by the former Chicago Great Western Route. The next station along the line is Bolton, which was more than seven miles from the South Freeport Station and about six miles from our current location at the Crane Creek Bridge. To get to Bolton, we'll head north along Baileyville Road for one and a quarter miles. We then turn left heading west along Lamb Road for one and a half miles. Upon reaching Illinois Route 26, we turn left again, heading due south for a short distance before turning right onto Becker School Road, which winds around for five miles before reaching Bolton Road. We turn left onto Bolton Road, which curves south and takes us for a half mile to the community of Bolton on the west side of the road. Here we turn right onto Main Street and drive a short distance to where the road curves south, with the Bolton Station once standing off to the right. The Bolton Depot was located almost 400 feet due west of Bolton Road and about 80 feet north of Main Street along the north side of the tracks, in Bolton, in Stevenson County, Illinois. The station stood where a garage presently stands at the inside corner of Main Street as it curves southwards. We knocked on the door of the house associated with the garage, but unfortunately no one was at home, so we took our pictures and video from the street. We have no pictures or images of the Bolton station, but it was very likely a wooden structure with the standard CGW Victorian stick style design. Aerial photographs tell us that the station was the standard size, about 55 feet long by 20 feet wide. Bolton was a flag stop and was among the earliest stations of the Chicago Great Western, showing up on the 1888 train schedules as Bolton. The earliest maps of the town and station indicate that the depot was also the town's post office. There were stockyards to the west of the depot and to the south of the tracks. 
A warehouse also stood to the south of the tracks, just west of the depot. There were significant sightings here as well, two sightings from Bolton Road running several hundred feet westward. By 1913, a grain elevator also stood to the south of the tracks, just west of the depot. By 1939, aerial photographs indicate multiple structures within the rail yard, in addition to the depot, all on the south side of the tracks and extending more than 300 feet westward. Reports indicate that the rail yard also included a lumber yard and a creamery. In 1933, the Bolton station agent was removed as part of an overall retrenchment program. Train timetables indicate that the station had pretty much gone out of use by the 1950 time frame. The depot structure was then torn down by the mid-1950s, according to aerial photographs from the time. The wooden grain elevator to the south of the tracks, having been built around 1900, was intentionally burned to the ground in 1971. Today, all traces of the station and outbuildings are long gone, and it would be hard to know that a substantial rail yard ever stood here. The small town of Bolton was named for local landowner Fenno de Lorenzo Bolton, who was born in New York in the mid-1830s, migrated to Illinois with his parents in 1850, and settled in Florence Township along with his wife, Rhoda Scoville Bolton. The Boltons opened a boarding house while the railroad was under construction, serving meals to the construction workers. Their house evolved permanently into a hotel once the railroad was built. Prior to the coming of the railway, the original settlement was referred to as Van Brocklin and was located just a short distance north of the present-day Bolton, along Yellow Creek. Van Brocklin consisted of a church, a general store, a post office, and a few homes, and was named in honor of early settler Conrad Van Brocklin. With the coming of the railway in 1887, there was some early competition and consternation regarding the new town and station name. The railway wanted to name the town Ellis, in deference to another local wealthy landowner, Peter Terry Ellis, who had died a decade earlier. They perhaps viewed this as a solution to the Bailton town name confusion we spoke of in a previous video. And in fact, the original post office for this location was named Ellis. However, the Bolton family name somehow prevailed. The Ellis family, however, was playing the long game, as both the Bolton family and Van Brocklins were later destined to spend eternity in the Ellis Cemetery just down the road. By 1910, Bolton hosted a population of about 50 people and included the train depot, a grain elevator, a creamery, and a distillery. In June of 1913, a cyclone hit the small town, unroofing the Chicago Great Western Depot and destroying several small farm buildings in the area. The Bolton Post Office was eventually abandoned in 1931 due to low usage. And as we've learned, passenger train service stopped in the 1950s. Nonetheless, this railroad town has tenaciously hung on. Today, Bolton is an unincorporated community in Florence Township, Stevenson County, Illinois, consisting of a dozen or so homes. Our next stop is Pearl City, a little over five and a half miles to the west-northwest. Along the way, we're going to see whether we can get a closer look at one of the many small rural CGW bridges in the area, this one located along Lauren Road. We first head north along Bolton Road, Illinois Route 17, for a little more than two and a half miles. When we reach Pearl City Road, we turn left, heading west, and wind along Pearl City Road for two and a half miles. We turn left, heading southwest onto Block Road. We 
We travel for another one and a third miles, turning left, southwards, onto Mill Grove Road. We then travel a little more than a mile, crossing over Yellow Creek. We turn right, heading west, onto Lauren Road, and travel about a half mile, parking along the road to the south of the bridge site. We'll use the drone to get a closer look at this bridge. We fly over fields swelling with corn to the bridge site in the distance. Within range, we can see that the small bridge is still intact. We'll get a side view so as to see the bridge construction. From this angle, the bridge appears to be made of concrete, spanning perhaps 40 feet. This may have been a rebuild from a stone bridge or wooden bridge from earlier days. In any event, it gives us a good sense of the construction of some of these smaller rural bridges for the many creeks in the area, at least late in the lifespan of the Chicago Great Western. It's not too much further from here to Pearl City. We continue westward along Lauren Road for another two miles. We turn right, heading north, onto Illinois Route 73, which will take us directly into the heart of Pearl City, less than a mile and a half down the road. We enter Pearl City from the south and drive along its main street until Devore Avenue, where we turn right in order to reach the former Chicago Great Western Station site from the southeast. Passing by the oh-so-familiar row of grain elevators, which runs along the former CGW right-of-way, we turn northwest. Just to our right, southeast of the red brick U.S. Post Office building, was the location of the Chicago Great Western Depot. According to aerial photographs, the original Pearl City Depot was located about 320 feet east of Illinois Route 73 and about 220 feet south of North Street, putting it a little more than 250 feet southeast of the U.S. Post Office. The depot sat to the north of the tracks. Aerial photos also tell us that this original station was about 55 feet long by 20 feet wide. In other words, the standard CDW depot footprint. The original Pearl City Depot was a wooden structure with an architecture typical of the Chicago Great Western stations, the Victorian stick style design. About 50 feet southeast of the depot stood a wooden baggage shed. Early maps show that the rail yard also included a grain elevator and a coal elevator to the south of the tracks opposite the depot. A coal shed stood a few hundred feet further southeast of these elevators. On the north side of the track stood a creamery, perhaps 100 feet to the northwest of the depot. Two substantial sidings extended from Illinois Route 73 to hundreds of feet southeast of the depot. Like the Bolton and South Freeport stations, the Pearl City Station was among the original Chicago Great Western stations, established in the 1887 to 1888 time frame. It was originally referred to as Yellow Creek. The original depot stood and served for more than 60 years, when it was partially destroyed by a freight car derailment in 1953. This prompted the dismantling of the badly damaged depot, with its lumber used to build a shelter house at a new Pearl City Park. The new depot, of a thoroughly different design, was built in the same time frame to replace the original. It was smaller in size, of cinder block construction with a flat roof. As is evident, there is no trace of the Chicago Great Western Depot today. Only the line of the grain elevators betrays the former presence of the Chicago Great Western Rail Yard. The abandoned cinder block depot stood for at least a few decades after it went out of use, surviving into the early 1990s before finally being torn down. The village of Pearl City, not to be confused with Emerald City, actually had its origins in a small settlement along Yellow Creek, going back to the 1850s, which included a blacksmith shop, a general store, a U.S. post office, and a few houses. 
with both the post office and the settlement, appropriately named Yellow Creek. When the Chicago Great Western Railway was plotted through the area in 1887, they drew the route to the south of Yellow Creek and the early settlement. And like Bolton to the east, there arose disputes as to the new station and town name, meandering for months between Ebby, Seabold, and Kleckner, all wealthy local farmers, before retreating to the name Yellow Creek. Naturally, new stores and businesses wanted to be close to the new train depot, and so a second town center grew up to the south of the Great Western Rail Yard. When the station was established, wooden grain elevators were put up to the south of the tracks. A hotel and bank sprang up along the main street, Illinois Route 73. Several new houses were built along newly platted streets, along with a few churches. In short order, a newspaper was established. Spurred by its blossoming business and population, the village formally incorporated as Yellow Creek in 1891 but soon changed its name to Pearl City within a few years, as they apparently did not want to emphasize their proximity to the waterway. The unusual new name of Pearl City came from the story of a local resident, Daniel Ditzler, who was said to have found a few pearls within Yellow Creek in the late 1880s, one being so large that he sold it for $800, more than $30,000 in 2020 money sufficient to build a new house. No additional pearls were ever found along Yellow Creek, which does make one wonder whether some unfortunate soul in the area had lost a few pearls at some point in the past. But the ambitious Pearl City prospered, and by the 1910s, the town center along Illinois Route 73 supported more than 20 businesses, including general stores, hardware stores, millineries, dry goods stores, drug stores, blacksmith shops, and livery stables. In fact, it was doing so well that it vied with Stockton and South Freeport as being the Chicago Great Western division point between Dubuque and Chicago, with South Freeport eventually winning out. Through the decades, Pearl City's population stabilized at about 500 residents. A new U.S. post office was built in the 1970s along the abandoned Chicago Great Western right-of-way, along Illinois Route 73. And in recent years, the small railroad town has thrived, today boasting more than 800 residents within its district. We'll close out this chapter of our Chicago Great Western disused station tour along the former Pearl City Rail Yard in Lauren Township, Stevenson County, Illinois. If you are enjoying these videos, please remember to like, subscribe, share, and comment. It truly helps our channel grow and informs us as to what our viewers are interested in seeing. In the next episode of this journey, we'll continue onwards west by northwest across Stevenson County, Illinois, before heading into the northwest corner of Illinois, scenic Joe Davies County. We'll see you then.